Welcome to Miners Hall Museum. For those of you who this may be your first time here, um, <clears throat> I get the pleasure today of introducing our interns and their and their uh, research work. And I wanted to start by just thinking many of you who have been to this museum have really enjoyed the artwork that we have on display. You know, everything from our murals, which are indoors and outdoors, to our paintings, to our uh, charcoal drawing like in the uh, entrance and so truly history the history we have really does create a lot of art so you know history creates art but art also creates history you know before Archimedes had a had a um, principle before Pythagoras had a serum people really determined their humanity and their history through the arts that's how we started so we here at Miners Hall were really excited in the spring when we got a call from Pittsburgh State University. And actually it was the chairman of the art department, Dr. Uh, Jamie Oliver, and his also professor of art history, Lee Lan Sang, who said that they had a couple of uh, young students who wanted to come out to the, uh, the museum in the fall and do an internship. So that was really exciting to start. The girls did come out in August, and uh, they dived right into the library that we had. They checked out the local writers that we have back in our library. They looked at the collections. They examined the displays. They talked to the collections manager about, they learned about how things are assessed here and how things are um, cataloged. And then they took their research, and they decided to design blogs, weekly blogs, and they wrote up those for our Facebook page. Some of you have probably read them. If you haven't, they're still still on there. Some real exciting things that they discovered about their research. Uh, they also uh, became minor celebrities because they appeared on TV <laughs> interviews and on a radio interview, and, and one of those uh, interviews became global. I think it went out to different countries. So I'd like to uh, tell you a little bit about them and then they're gonna do their presentation. Katie Wells, originally from uh, Wichita, she's gonna graduate this December. She'll have a degree, a Bachelor's of Arts, of Fine Arts, uh, in a matter of days. Uh, she expects to get to Kansas City and immediately she's looking for a job either as an art curator or a gallery coordinator, possibly. Katie, while she was here, really enjoyed uh, researching women, the uh, miners' wives and, and their lives. So you're gonna hear a little bit about that today. Uh, while she's in her uh, art program, she's worked in watercolors and oils, and uh, she has a real fascination with kind of researching famous <coughs> women artists. Rosemary Stapleton is from Bartlesville, Oklahoma, but she has lived here in Pittsburgh since 2015. Uh, she'll graduate next year. But she has plans, she says, maybe to uh, move on to the University of Oklahoma, perhaps, and get a master's in library science, or maybe the University of Kansas and get a master's in fine arts. Um, during her time working here, she really enjoyed, she said, the local history, but she got involved in our, our, labor, our labor history, which is really dynamic. Um, she likes to work primarily in drawing and printmaking, and uh, she also is very much interested in the art and design of the periods, of, like the 20th century, I think, social movements. So with that, I would very much like for you to welcome both Katie Wells and Rosemary Stapleton. Hello everybody, it's nice to see so many people out here today. Uh, I'm Katie. I'm Rosemary. <laughs> and as was said earlier, we were interns here throughout this winter semester and we had a really wonderful time. The purpose of our internship was to do something that was both beneficial for the museum and for a research pro project for us to present. And uh, one of the things we did is we made a blog. I did lots of blogs about women's history, about the recipes from a book I've read. And Rosemary did a lot of blogs about miners' lives and their workplaces. And another part thing that we researched was this book. Um, it was excerpts from an album that Ira Clemens had made. 
and they are photos that were meant to advertise to uh, foreign people in Eastern Europe and on the East Coast to come into the mining towns and to work in the Southeast Kansas. Uh, so uh, we have some, before we get started, we have some acknowledgements we'd like to make. Um, first of all, we'd like to thank uh, Phyllis Bittner, Linda Canole, Susan Besser, and Ron Pommier for helping us out a huge amount here at the Myers Hall Museum. They've really been a great help in our research. Uh, then we would like to thank our advisors, Dr. Lee Van Seng and Professor James Oliver, uh, also for being just a massive help throughout all of this. Uh, then uh, we'd like to thank the Myers Hall Museum as a whole and the community that is uh, invested in the museum, as well as the Pittsburgh Public Library uh, for being a valuable resource in local history as well. Oh, I forgot that mic. <laughs> uh, so uh, coal mining in Southeast Kansas uh, began uh, Roughly in the early 1870s in Cherokee County, uh, it began with uh, primarily underground mining. Uh, there was mining kind of higher quality coal that could be used for locomotives and things like that. Uh, it wasn't until later in the 1930s that steam shovel technology improved enough that um, strip mining, so like surface mining, uh, was a more viable way to produce high amounts of good quality coal. And uh, I couldn't really find a consistent source on when exactly it ended in the area, but I gather it was roughly the 1970s or 1980s. And as we went through this research project, we read through several sources, and we decided rather than speaking about one specific historical family in Southeast Kansas, we decided to compile all of those stories to make a generalized history about a family called the uh, Kovacs, I believe it's pronounced. I just heard from that from Mr. Kovac Kovac? Kovac, Kovac today. Um, but the, Kovo the Kovac were a Slovenian immigrant family, this is the fictional story, and we're covering the daily lives of miners in Southeast Kansas from 1900 to 1920. And one of our ma my major sources, I specifically researched women's lives, how they maintained the homestead, how they raised their children and families, and the work that they did through this book called Raisin Pie in a Miner's Bucket. And this is a compilation of women's stories, interviews, including children of these women. And a lot of the, all of these stories are ended with family recipes that are very famous among these families. And it was a really wonderful resource to hear personal accounts of how these strong women impacted all of their children and their great-grandchildren and their great-great-grandchildren. Um, uh, likewise, I use uh, this book, uh, Coal Mining Days. Uh, this is a compilation of um, interviews and stories uh, by miners and their children and grandchildren talking about daily lives. Uh, in this area working as miners. Uh, it really goes very in depth, going from about 1870 to into the 1940s and 50s, a little bit later. Um, and this was compiled by Debbie Close, and she also wrote a really great series of articles that were published in the Morning Sun in the early 2000s that I also used as a primary source for this paper. Another major resource of ours was the Coal Corner Carousel back there, those two large uh, tiered bookshelves that rotate. They have historical documents, diaries, interviews, marriage certificates, and newspaper articles from several areas throughout Southeast Kansas, from Arma, Franklin, Frontenac, and towns that no longer exist, like Dogtown and Frogtown. Uh, one of my favorite resources from this was the Frogtown book. It was a comp a lot, most of it was comp compiled by a man named Chuck Ailes, and his family was a really prominent family here in the Southeast Kansas area. They were coal miners, and then a lot of their children grew up to be teachers and nurses and really loving wives and doctors. And it was a very interesting resource. And the Pittsburgh Public Library. Yeah. <laughs> that was also another major resource. Uh, so the Kovacs, the, Co the Kovac, the Kovaches immigrated uh, because of a lot of political and economic struggles in Slovenia at the time. We're talking roughly around 1900. Uh, Slovenia at the time was actually part of a larger group called Yugoslavia. And Yugoslavia was occupied by the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And there were constant political changes and economic changes. And that made it more a very insecure place to raise a family. 
Uh, there was also a major earthquake in the what is now the capital of Slovenia called Ljubljana, and that earthquake was about a 6.1 magnitude earthquake, and it caused a lot of major damage, and it really harmed the economic system of Slovenia at the time. And so Mr. Kovac, as Rosemary will talk about later, and what we referenced in this book with the pamphlets that recruited minors, he was recruited from Slovenia to Kansas for a better life for him and his wife. And when they immigrated, uh, they weren't entirely told the truth. They were told that they were going to go to these really well-developed towns with paved streets and these beautiful homes, and they would have these really great, well-paying jobs. And then they moved, and they found these absolutely tiny houses. And coal camp houses originally were made to be picked up and moved from coal camp to coal camp as, every, as each mine ran out of coal, which is why a lot of the small towns like Frogtown and Dogtown don't exist anymore because there's no industry in those areas anymore. And these houses had poor insulation because they did not have foundations because they were meant to be picked up and moved. The rooms were also fairly small. Uh, Rosemary wrote in our paper that we wrote, uh, they were about the size of a two-car garage, and those, they usually housed up to 15 people because these families had lots and lots of children. There was also no electricity or water because there wasn't the ability to hook anything up to water, so they usually used wells or rivers to get their water. And then a story from Raisin Pie that really, really touched me was about a Slovenian immigrant named Anna Malmsek. I believe that's how her name is pronounced. She immigrated from Slovenia to the United States in 1905 and lived in a coal camp house with her husband and her children. And back in Slovenia, they had something called a piek, which is a coal or wood-burning stove with ceramic tiles on top. And the ceramic tiles heated the house evenly enough that children could even sleep on top of the stove to stay warm at night. And in the coal camp houses, they had much smaller stoves. The houses weren't as well insulated because Slovenia or Yugoslavia at the time was a much more developed country. So the houses were a bit more secure. Um, so she spent the entire winter of 1905 weeping for her children and weeping for her piet because they were so cold and miserable that she worried her kids would not make it through the winter. So they did not always come to a perfect, perfect living scenario. And another thing that Mrs. Uh, Kovac had to do was she had to maintain, maintain the homestead. Uh, Rosemary will mention later, but food was not a very affordable resource, especially with the way that the miners were paid. So a lot of them had to garden and set and do farming. They would raise animals. A lot of the times they would raise a pig throughout the summer and butcher it and eat its meat throughout the winter. They had chickens. A lot of them hunted rabbits and went fishing. And then the women's job is they would jelly, can, pickle. They would dry it. They would smoke it. They would butcher the chicken in the morning and cook it in the evening. They did all of the food preparation. And that was a really labor intensive job, especially because nowadays, if I go to the grocery store and I want to make fried chicken, I would pick up a chicken that's already been butchered and cut up for me. I would have to kill that chicken myself if I was in a home in a town in about 1910. I'd have to kill the chicken myself. I'd have to pluck it. I'd have to boil it. I'd have to cook it. I'd have to butcher it. It's just a lot of work. And moms would often wake up at 4 a.m. and they would not stop working until they went to sleep because the cleaning was never done because there was always coal dust in the air. And they always had to, um, they had to maintain the livestock, they had to maintain the garden. They had to make, wash, and mend most of their clothes. And they also often had to do additional jobs to help with the income for the family, either by doing laundry for neighbors or working in boarding houses where they fed and clothed bachelor minors. And a lot of the times, because these families had lots of children, this woman was always either managing her toddlers or she was pregnant or she was helping educate her kids all at the same time. So it was a really complicated job. Uh, now, Mr. Kovac uh, worked as a coal miner uh, here in the area, uh, probably as a deep miner underground. Uh, so miners uh, historically and really still today uh, were uh, horrifically underpaid, especially for how dangerous the work was. So um, according to a union uh, handbook, or uh, I think it was a agreement uh, for the district I found, uh, said that a driver excavating horizontal passages 
uh, would have made in, I believe, 1904 was roughly equivalent to $82 uh, per day. Uh, so it was something like $2.50. Um, but uh, while that looks decent on paper, um, mining companies would deduct pay for the smallest of mistakes that miners made. And additionally, uh, miners were not provided equipment by the company, so they had to buy or typically rent equipment from the mining company at a very steep markup. And these wages were also paid exclusively in scrip, so a coin or token that could only be used um, at the company store. And at uh, these company stores, uh, prices were typically uh, marked up by as much as triple the average price at other stores in the area. Now, uh, in addition to being very underpaid, it was inherently a incredibly dangerous profession, and it still is today, uh, but these were much worse, you know, 120 years ago. Uh, so one very major hazard was the presence of gas underground. Uh, this was typically methane, and it could suffocate miners, but it was also very flammable, so it ca caused anything from uh, very small fires to massive explosions when in conjunction with coal dust and other issues in the mine. And uh, until, shockingly late, uh, miners had uh, lamps like this one with an open flame that would ignite uh, the methane in the mine. And uh, there was one story in coal mining days I found very interesting where a boy went to work in the mines with his father when he was around 12 years old. He dropped out of school about then. And um, he, when he first went to the mine, they burned off the methane that was on the ceiling of the mine. And it was this blue flame across the top. And he also remembered his father's uh, light uh, lighting a very small fire in front of his face that he had to extinguish, and uh, they didn't really react a lot. Like, this was just a normal day-to-day -day issue that they encountered. Um, and this was kind of in conjunction with the hazards with fire and explosion, but another very prevalent issue was rock falls and cave -ins. And these could range from massive cave that would have uh, killed everyone working in the mine to very small rock falls that would have maybe just crushed a finger. Um, and these were very much exacerbated by the lack of proper safety equipment. So miners would often just wear something like this with no protection for their head at all, really. Uh, it wasn't until uh, much later, after World War I, that miners began to have proper hel safety helmets in mining. And it also wasn't until then that they had safety lamps, so electric headlights that would prevent fires. Along with the hazards that came with being a miner, a lot of children and mothers lived in fear of the men in their lives being injured in the mines. Uh, three times a day, a mine whistle would blow. Most of the homes were close enough that people could hear the mine whistle, and the schools were close enough that they could also hear the mine whistle. It would announce when it was time to open and go work in the mines. Sometimes it would announce if there was even work that day. It would also announce when lunchtime happened, and it would announce when it was time to close. If it blew at any other time during the day, that meant an accident had happened and someone had been injured. And it could be anything like Rosemary said, from a rock fall that broke a finger to an explosion that killed everyone in the mine. And that created a lot of anxiety for children and for families throughout the day if they heard that mine whistle. Because a lot of the times, if there was a cave-in, they wouldn't know if anyone was safe until they were able to open up the cave-in and go rescue the miners that were inside. So a lot of uh, miners in the area were very active in their union, uh, the United Mine Workers of America. Um, a lot of accounts in coal mining days uh, are from the children of miners who recall being very poor, but that their fathers were incredibly committed to the union and that they always paid their union dues. One account said it was about $3 a month. Uh, I believe that was around 1920, but I could be wrong. Um, and uh, these... Miners were just incredibly committed to the union. They could, and because this enabled them to strike for better conditions, better pay, and just overall better treatment by the mining companies. Um, the, and the entire family was committed to this as well. Yes. So before I talk about this section, I wanted to give a, some recognition to Linda Knoll. 
who was a major resource for this event. She's done lots of research. She has, has a website that she's made that documents lots of newspaper articles and lots of important parts of this event. And it's been, it's been an honor working with her in researching this event. Um, so the Amazon Army March. Around World War I, miners' wages were increased because there was a really high demand for coal because they needed the fuel to fuel the war. After World War I had ended, a lot of these miners' wages were cut because there wasn't as high of a demand for their resource anymore. But these families had grown accustomed to this raise in wages, and they were going to go hungry without this extra income. And so the miners started to strike. And then in retaliation, the Attorney General of Kansas banned miners from striking because when miners struck, there was a major loss of resources because coal was something that powered the entire country at the time. Uh, so, and even after the ban, miners continued to choose to strike, but then they were replaced by non-union miners called scab labor. And this absolutely enraged the women in these mining families because then their husband strike meant nothing and it meant that there was no, gonna be no change, there's gonna be no improvement of income or improvement of safety. So they decided to organize together and protest. So on December 12th of 1921, uh, women front met in front of the Franklin Community Hall, and the Franklin Community Hall is where this museum is standing today. This museum used to be the Franklin Community Hall. And they gathered four in a row, and they held American flags, and they held up pots and pans, and they held up the lunch buckets that their miners, that their husbands would take into work. And they marched for three days to entrances of mines and chased off the scab labor. Um, in this story, there's another account from a man named Jean de Grusen, whose grandmother, I believe, was one of the women who was in this march. And she provided red pepper flakes for all the ladies, and they held them in their pockets. And they would throw them in the faces of scab miners that were trying to get into the mine. And they were yelling, and they were screaming, and they were chasing all the guys away. And they essentially created a forced strike so that the strike still continued. They would even pick up milk cans and lunch buckets and they would hit miners with them to chase them away. So they were a pretty scary group. <laughs> and they grew, the, the confirmed amount is 2,000 women, but some accounts say that they grew, the crowd grew to as even many as 6,000 women. And the march gained national attention. They were called the Amazon Army. And the governor actually had to send out a militia to come and chase them away. And this gained so much national attention that eventually it is, it is linked to the uh, constitutional ban of the right to strike that was declared in 1925. It was declared unconstitutional to deny people the ability to strike. So it was, this was a really major event that happened in this community. It was really interesting to research. Go for it. So childhood. Uh, so these, par these families weren't just the adults working in the mines and the women maintaining the homestead. They also had, as I said earlier, as many as 13 children, even more. And these kids, they lived, if not short, they lived fun childhoods. Their parents were involved. They were loving. They had really wonderful church ties and lots of community events. And they would do games. They would go sledding. They would go swimming. They would go ice skating. But they couldn't afford ice skates, so they would ice skate on just their regular shoes. Um, lots of the boys went hunting and fishing. It was a way for them to have uh, activity with their friends, but also a way for them to provide. Um, I read a story about boys that would have a rabbit cook-off, and whoever caught the least rabbits had to be the guy that cleaned and skinned all of them, and they would have a cook-off for the neighborhood. Um, they also had lots of chores. They helped their mother care for the livestock. Uh, they would draw water from the well for bathing and for cleaning. Uh, women helped cook. And they also had chores where they would have to go milk the cows and they'd take the milk bucket and they'd deliver and sell milk to neighbors to help provide for the family. And Rosemary has a personal connection to this story. Um, kids did not wear shoes in the summer because shoes were too expensive, so they only wore them when it was too cold to go without. Yeah, so a lot of uh, mining families uh, at this time, you know, they wouldn't be able to uh, purchase shoes for their children. Uh, it was the same in my family back in the day. So they would take uh, scraps from old tires or, you know, I'm, I assume like old pieces of just thick fabric to make homemade shoes for their children. And uh, a lot of times kids would also be working in the summer, so they needed to protect their feet when they were like out in the fields and stuff. And then sons and daughters, they had similar chores, but the expectation of when they grew up was very different. 
So for daughters and sons, they both went to school um, until child labor was banned in 1905. They went, or after child labor was banned in 1905, children typically went to school to up to sixth or eighth grade. And then it was less likely for them to go to high school and college after that because they needed to work and provide for the family. Uh, the daughter's chores, she was more prepared to become a wife. She was taught all of the womanly duties. She was taught how to farm, how to garden, how to maintain the livestock, how to clean the house, how to make and mend clothes, um, how to cook, and th those, those were usually her expected duties. And uh, sons tend to work, tended to work kind of a lot of odd jobs outside of just doing uh, chores at home. Uh, many worked to, in the community, helping out on farms, uh, running deliveries for local shops. Uh, there are a few accounts of boys you know, delivering the paper. Um, there was one story I thought was very interesting where uh, there's a boy who he did go on to be a minor uh, as a child, but when he was eight or nine years old, he lit the gas lamps in Leven. Um, in the area just to make a little bit of money and all this obviously went back to help support his family. And these kids, they had fun childhoods, but they were not always happy and they were not always very long. Um, the sad reality is that when you live, you're living in poverty, there's not a lot of health care, your father could die in the mines, your mother could die from anywhere from an illness to childbirth, so you were often expected to replace your parent. Uh, for girls, it was that they replaced their mother. They started doing the 4 a.m. to when they, till when they went to sleep schedule. And a lot of them have had to replace their mothers at as young as 11 years old. There was a story in Raisin Pie Again where several stories actually where girls as young as 11 had to replace their mothers because they died in childbirth or from gallstones or from another easily treatable condition that they just couldn't afford to treat. So daughters often had to give up school. This is a school book that we, this is actually one of Rosemary's school books. Um, kids would learn to read with these and then they would take them to school with them. She had to put this down and pick up the iron. She had to start doing, and this is not light, this is real heavy. She had to start doing the heavy labor of the home. She had to, if her mother died in childbirth, she had to raise an infant with her siblings. And that was a really, really tough job. And for the son in the family, uh, if the father was killed or disabled or you know, otherwise unable to work as a minor, um, sometimes families would uh, change tracks entirely and go farm, but sometimes that just wasn't feasible. So uh, boys as young as you know, nine or 10 years old would really have no choice except to go to work in the mines uh, ju in just as dangerous a, a job as the adult men there. And while uh, there were no child labor laws until 1905, but even after these laws were instituted that prevented children under 14 from working in mines or factories or meatpacking plants, um, these weren't really enforced uh, pretty often by companies. So, and they weren't, and even by families, sometimes families would go desperate enough that they would lie about their son's age so that they could go work in the mines to bring money back anyway. So there was one story in coal mining days of a boy who began working in the mines when he was 12 years old. And this was at a point where you couldn't work in the mines until you were 14 anyway. And uh, I believe that this photo was actually taken in Pennsylvania, but uh, before these labor laws were instituted, there really were a lot of children working in the mines. There's one story of a six-year-old boy who would throw stones underneath oncoming mine carts if they were going too fast to slow them down. Now let's say that they were given the opportunity to go to high school, possibly graduate college. There were a significant amount of opportunities available to them after that, especially after the establishment of labor laws. It became more of an incentive for parents to let their kids complete school because they saw the, more, the better options that they had afterwards. And even before the advent of child labor laws, there were some families that absolutely refused to allow their kids to work in the mines because they came to America to work the hard jobs so that their kids could have better jobs. Uh, for women, uh, they were often housewives, obviously, and that was a very well-respected position in the home. Women were the ones in charge of making most of the decisions for their children and for their education. Um, and a lot of women afterwards, when their daughters graduated high school, they would become teachers. After the advent of World War I, they became nurses. A lot of them worked as store clerks in company stores and local grocery stores. 
and some women were even able to work as waymasters. And waymasters were essentially the people that determined the quality of coal and how much the miner would be paid. Women weren't allowed to work inside the mines doing the manual labor, but if she was skilled enough, she could be a waymaster. And this photo here is of Russ Hall from Pittsburgh State University, which was originally called the Kansas Manual Training Normal School Auxiliary, a very big mouthful of a name. And the school was originally made to train teachers for the growing population in Kansas to go teach at public schools. So there was a really high demand for teachers around the start of uh, the late, or after about 1915, there was more of a demand for teachers because these communities were growing so quickly. So women had not more opportunities to work as, as teachers. And for the son of the family, uh, if he uh, did work in the mines as a child, oftentimes he would continue to work as a miner until he retired. Uh, many men did, who worked as miners uh, changed career tracks to work, be as farmers instead. Uh, then if he had been able to continue his education and maybe graduate high school, uh, his career opportunities would have been a lot broader. He would have had the option to go on to college to become a teacher or an engineer or a similar job. A lot of men also worked as uh, running small businesses, you know, grocery stores, stuff like that. Uh, many also went on to different kinds of industry jobs, so like metal manufacturing and working in oil refineries. Now, uh, with our fictional family, uh, John Kovach, the son of the family, would not have been old enough to wo work in World War One. although he, w sorry, serve in World War I, although uh, he would have been helping with the war effort back home. But an interesting fact about that is that uh, a lot of miners were exempt from the draft because coal was obviously very necessary for the war effort. And another thing we wanted to acknowledge was the absolute melting pot that this area of Kansas is called. Obviously, we had the little Balkans Day Festival, but there were so many people from so many different countries that came and combined their cultural traditions, their cuisine, their religious practices all into this area. And a few of these flags, the large one on the left is the Slovenian flag, which is where the Kovacs are from. Uh, we also have a Lithuanian, a Slovakian, Hungary, Croatia, France, Italy, Poland, Lebanon, Syria, Sweden, and Germany. We have all of those flags up there. And that is just a small fraction of a lot of these people that combined their cultures together once they moved into southeast Kansas. Now, even though uh, mining has long since ceased in southeast Kansas, uh, the foundation it built for the population here and the community uh, is obviously very strong and still continuing today. So a lot of local businesses and a lot of the cultural impact here has its roots in mining. Uh, like Katie said, uh, Pittsburgh State did have its roots in mining, training miners, you know, technical training and training teachers and stuff. And then obviously most of the towns in the area uh, have their roots as coal camps, um, not Pittsburgh, but like Frank Franklin, Frontenac, Arma. Then uh, it has all the local history museums are here because of mining, especially this one, fun fact. And then the lasting cultural impact of the Amazon army, which Katie already talked about, uh, the little Balkan States Festival, uh, every day, Labor Day weekend that celebrates the cultural heritage of the miners who originally immigrated here. Uh, many small businesses like uh, Chicken Annie's, Chicken Mary's, and Frontenac Bakery have roots you know, in mining or they began to help support miners and their families and they're you know, 50 or 80 or 100 years old. And one uh, impact, the soil impact of mining that I find very interesting is the uh, Mineland Wildlife Area. So uh, until 1969, uh, Mining companies were not required to restore the land after they finished uh, strip mining or surface mining in an area. So this was just left untouched and it was totally destroyed. So after, uh, you know, beginning in the 70s, uh, there, became, there began uh, very widespread reclamation efforts. So now we have the Mineland Wildlife Area with, you know, boating and fishing and all that fun stuff. And we just want to thank you guys again for coming and listening to our presentation today. This has been a really wonderful opportunity to research and to work with the Miners Hall Museum.
for me personally to get to know this area better. I'm from Wichita, so I had no familiarity with the coal mining industry before I started this internship, and it's been a really wonderful opportunity to learn. Yep. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we'd like to say thank you to these girls, too. We have thoroughly enjoyed having them here. They have just been uh, wonderful to work with, and we've appreciated all the research that they've done and the information that they have shared with all of you here today. And we were glad that we were able to give them this opportunity when we had uh, a nice crowd here today to hear their presentation. And, and we really thank you girls both, and we really enjoyed having you the whole time. So thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank and you. We're gonna thank it's going to just take us a couple minutes, and we're going to move right into our program. So just sit tight. We'll, we'll be right with you in just a second. Okay, well, I've just got a couple of announcements to make while they're getting mic'd up, so we'll be ready to start. Uh, and I'd like to also thank uh, the professors in PSU for working with us on this project. We, we love having the interns here. They, uh, uh, we've had others in the past, and then COVID kind of put a stall on all of that, so we're glad to have them back working with us again and everything. And for those of you who don't know, I'm Phyllis Bittner. I'm a trustee here at the museum. Uh, I grew up here in Franklin, and I am a... Uh, Croatian descendant. Uh, my family was the, we said Stimac, but it's Stimats in Croatia. They settled in Cherokee County. My mother was Croatian. And so I've uh, worked with Strawberry Hill, or they have worked with me, and we are co-hosting the exhibit. If you haven't had a chance to see it yet, it's back over in that corner of the museum. And tell us just a little overview of the country of Croatia, and it's really a beautiful country. We actually visited there about five years ago. Um, and so it just kind of gives you that little bit of an overview of what life was like over there. And uh, our guest today will share a little bit of information about uh, more about that. Uh, so we'd like to thank all of you for coming uh, for that. Uh, I'd also like to mention that there were uh, several people who contributed to the exhibit, and that was the Yavni family. And I see they aren't here today. Uh, they've come to all of the programs and everything. But And we realize we're competing. There are several big events going on today. The, the Cantata, there's something at Pitt State, something at the library. So uh, we know a lot of people are going to miss this. But you can, thanks to David Wallace right here, you can go to YouTube, and I always share it on our Miners Hall Museum page, and he is, his name on YouTube is Easy Dave. You can see any of our programs. He videos all of them, so you can go back and see any of the programs that you might have missed in the past. Uh, so I want to take, thank the Yodney family and George Barbreach also, uh, who contributed a lot to that exhibit. So our Two presenters today are Tony Kovac and Janie Hayes, who are both associated in some way with, with Strawberry Hill, Hill Museum, and they're going to present our program, which is Croatian Customs and Cuisine. Tony's going to share about the customs and traditions celebrated throughout the year. Janie's going to discuss the cuisine through the holidays and their tr traditions as they bring. So I'd like to welcome both of them up, and they'll uh, take you into the program now. Thank you. Now, this photo here, do you need that mic? Okay. This photo here is of my grandparents, okay? That's my grandpa, this Grandpa Kolich, who had been deceased for quite a while. I mean, I'm 69, so you know they've been deceased for a while. And my grandma, Kovic. Now, she was a Gormorats. And then when they came to America, they called her, they, their last name was changed to Gorman, or they pronounced it Gorman. And my grandpa, Kovic. And what they're drinking is homemade wine. My grandpa uh, learned how to make wine in Croatia. He came over when he was 17. And I can remember him telling me the story of his immigration on the night that John F. Kennedy came to Kansas City, Missouri to speak. And that was in October of 1960 when he was a senator and running for presidency. My parents went to listen to him and they left us four kids at my grandma and grandpa's until they came back to pick us up. While my brothers went upstairs to one of the bedrooms and sleep and my sister went upstairs to sleep. My grandpa sat there and had me sit on the sofa next to him as he wept and I will never forget it, and told me the story of how he got on the boat 
and he had a little hat on, you know, those kind that they drive, you know, the small ones with the little bill, and he waved it to his mother to never see her and his dad again. Now, they wrote, and later on, as phones became more accessible, occasionally they would call, but remember, I can remember when it was 10 cents a minute for a long distance, and so you can imagine how much it was for them. But he never saw them again. We had some friends that went over there and looked up his parents, and this was before the video recordings had sound, and so he actually filmed his mom and dad and some relatives and brought it back, and after church one Sunday, we all went to the house and watched the film, and my grandpa just sat there and cried. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really, I can't even imagine not seeing your kids again or your parents again. My parents died when they were 93, and I thought that was too soon. Mm -hmm. And they were only sick the, la sick the last three months of their life. And even today, I'm like, I wish I could pick up the phone and call them, mm -hmm. you know? I think of things that my mom would know the answer to that, unfortunately, I don't. Okay, so they were making wine, and that's my grandpa with his wine barrel. And the interesting about wine is it is a tradition for people to make wine. And when I've been over there three times, I'm supposed to go over in the spring again, and it's interesting because the place I go to, I've been to Dubrovnik and different places, but it's more countryfied, and you stay in somebody's home. And they have vineyards, like, growing up, and they're raising their grapes for their wine, although now, the last time I was there was about five years ago, and supposedly they're not supposed to make their own wine anymore. <laughs> but let's just say, <laughs> what you don't know, you don't know. <laughs> and so, but people, tourists, as they walk through, and I'm not just talking Americans, because when I was there, uh, I sat in church next to an Irish lady who said to me, oh, you look Irish. Are you from Ireland? And I said, no, I'm really, my grandparents and everybody are from Croatia. I mean, my parents and both of them. I mean, so I said, no. But there's people from all over, from different countries that are there. And anyway, they would just walk along these people's vineyards and eat the grapes. And I'm like, you're not supposed to do that. This is their, this is their food. I mean, they're not growing these grapes for us to eat, but that's life. This is apple strudel. This is my daughter. I have to thank my daughter and my cousins who shared some photos with me. This is apple strudel. You see apple strudel, you taste apple strudel. I don't care what country you're in, they have something to do with apples. And you know, people think of apple strudel, you think of Germany. Everybody has a little bit of twist. Now, we were raised to put a whole bunch of apples on ours. There's no skimp in there. And she didn't know I was doing this talk. I just called her and said, you know, Melissa, I never usually take pictures of my food. Do you have anything of apple strudel? She said, I do have one because I was teaching somebody how to make it. So I took a picture. And notice they're all nicely lined up. And you roll it up. And then in the end, you have apple strudel that you slice up and it's delicious and we were raised on it and my mom even when they were old she always she never used a mix master for that dough she always did it with her hands and she says it's what kept her mobility going and my dad later on towards you know as they got older they both became type 2 diabetics and so my mom just quit putting sugar in it and I even had a relative I went out to eat with about oh two or three weeks ago and she goes you know I remember your mom taking the sugar out and you couldn't even tell. And I said, yeah, you get used to it. We never noticed it after she did it. I mean, because the apples were good. They, we didn't use Granny Smith, obviously. That would have been too tart. But, you know, the apples were sweet. This is sauerkraut and sausage. Now, I think Tony told you all, maybe not, that one of my aunts started a restaurant in Kansas City, and it's where everybody had their weddings at, okay? And the whole community of Strawberry Hill, it didn't matter if you were Croatian, Irish, whatever, people had their weddings there. And we had polka bands there. And so her husband used to make his own sausage for a long time. After he died, then she bought it from another local vendor who made their sausage there in the store. But picture a wedding. Let me tell you, I had 800 people at my wedding. So 
think of St. John the Baptist Church, and they all left church, and then they went to the party. Because that's what it is. I had 300 people at my bridal shower. That marriage, by the way, did not work out. But the party was great. <laughs> and so, <laughs> but picture the wedding reception. And I called my cousins, too, to see, did any of us take pictures of our buffet? Even my cousins, whose mother had the restaurant, didn't have a picture of her buffet. We just took it for granted. But people would come. You'd have, first of all, would have brisket, barbecued brisket. Then would have fried chicken. Then we had sauerkraut and sausage. And then we had ham. We threw in some potato salad. And we had coleslaw, the Croatian versions of it. And then we had a relish dish, because you know you had to have some kind of veggie. A real, and then we had green beans. And then we had povetica. And then we still had the wedding cake, okay? So, and we kept it full all night long, and it was an open bar. And the men would take the ham and put it on the povetica, which is nut bread. Can you imagine the calories? Now, as a grown adult, I never did this when I was a child. But one Thanksgiving, I decided to try it. And so I took a piece of ham and a two slices of povetica to eat it as a sandwich. And I told my sister, I said, oh my gosh, we should have tried this years ago. <laughs> it is so good. And it really is good, but a lot of calories. So sauerkraut and sausage. And I still buy mine from a vendor, a, a butcher shop in Kansas City, Kansas. I go down there and I'll buy 10 rings of it. And they also have now where they have taken the sausage and they smoke it twice and they have it divided up like in four quarters. So that way you can throw it on your grill in the summer and have it get in a bun just right. So I'm telling you, food is my thing. Okay, this is summer tomatoes. My, grand, my dad always drew, grew a lot of tomatoes. And our version, Croatian version of sweet uh, potato salad. We called it Croatian potato salad or old fashioned potato salad. The potato salad with the mayo was new fashion new style. But this is basically oil and you had to use Mazzola and you put the oil on first so the potatoes would get coated. Then you put vinegar on it, salt and pepper and lots of onions and if you're doing it for company that was just something that I made this summer and I was showing my daughter that I ate a healthy meal because I had a whole bunch of tomatoes on it. <laughs> the rest of the meal was not healthy uh, but it was good. And if you're giving it for company, then you take some green onions and you chop them up and put them in there for decoration. So it looks better. <laughs> looks pretty. Okay, this is nada. And Tony, you call it something else. You know everything has several names. So well, you call it, my, we called it nada. You called it nada. Da -da. You made it the well, name. Not, not Dava, yeah. Okay. That, that's what my father called it. Yeah, and that is the real name, but our family sort of crunched it up, but there were like 44 of us grandkids, and so, you know, we just, it's not in my family. And what you do is at Easter and Christmas, and you can do it at Thanksgiving too, you can do it any time of the year, but it's when you have leftover ham, and you clean the bone, and you get cut off all the fat of the ham, and what you do is you have leftover bread, and you have to grade the bread though, you know, you make it real fine, and then you take bread, eggs, onions, ham, some people will cook bacon and throw bacon in there too. And then some people put it in casing. I don't do casing. My mom didn't do casing either. We used wax paper or you can use parchment paper. And after you get it all smashed up together and the right texture, you roll it up and you put it in there and you bake it in water in the oven for hours. And it's delicious. And my son, the reason I have those pictures is my son's wife because he always talked about it, and so I gave him one, and I took pictures so she could make it. And then she made it, and actually hers looked prettier than mine. Uh, this is dough. We're moving on now to povetica. And this is dough. This is my mother stretching the dough. What you do is you make your dough. My mom made so many povetizas throughout her life at Christmas. You know how you, all of you that were alive at the time can remember where you were at when John F. Kennedy was killed? I can tell you, we were baking povetica for the holidays. My mom had sent us upstairs for a break because all of us kids helped spread the nuts. 
and would wash the pans and stuff for her. And But while she was making more dough, she let us go upstairs and take a break, and we were watching TV. And we came downstairs, and my dad was down there helping her make dough because they'd make dough for 50 loaves. And, you know, so my dad would help her. And this is after he worked all day and stuff. But anyway, he, we came downstairs, and we told him that John F. Kennedy was shot. And my mom, and I remember, these are the people that went to listen to him speak. They couldn't believe it. They stopped what they were doing, and they went upstairs. And they wanted to stay and watch more because it was such a shock. But they had to go downstairs and continue baking because dough, you know, rises. And so that's my mom uh, stretching the dough. They actually roll it out a little bit. Then they take it and should throw it up in the air like when you see the pizza guys do it. But the pizza guys are just making one little pizza. Picture a table, you know, the tables that held, hold six people to eight people. Well, that stretch that ball of dough that thin, and I'll have a picture of that later. This is my cousins. I cut off their heads because I didn't know if they wanted their heads showing. <laughs> so I cut off their heads, but you have their hands. Uh, they're all starting to spread dough, and you keep on adding nuts. As you can see, there's little piles of nuts, and they'll add more nuts to it. This is my mom's uh, nut bread, and, and the nuts are really thick. As you can see, by the time you get it spread, you don't see any dough. The only dough you see is maybe a couple of inches on this back end that they're going to roll it into so that they can then slice it and cut it up. But that's her lifting up the big tablecloth, and I sort of scrunched the picture a little bit, so that she can roll it all up. And we all eat it. And that's her putting it in the pan. And they use a regular loaf pan. And by the time it's finished, it's raised up a little bit over the loaf, of, over the height of the pan. And that's a couple of loaves. And then these are little mini ro loaves. You know those little loaf pans that you can buy? at Target, Walmart, even Williams-Sonoma if you want to buy fancy ones. But my cousin, when her daughter was married, she made individual loaves for the attendees to take home with them. And then when my daughter was married, what she did was she made the full-size loaves and sliced them up and put them in bags so people, and she had plates, platters of these as you left, so people could take them with them to go. And there wasn't like you only got one, but she, you know, you could take whatever you wanted. And she put a little note down what it was. So Pomatitz is a big deal for us. We have it at every holiday. We have it in the summer. We have it all year long. In fact, I got the best deal the other day. My daughter was in town for my birthday. And she, we were supposed to, I was supposed to go down to Asheville to visit her when it snowed here. Okay, so didn't go. And because I didn't know what the weather was going to do. Well, she had bought a friend of hers just some Kansas local beers, and I was going to bring them down. Well, since it snowed and I didn't go, she called me and she said, just go give them to our cousin, Joanne, because they had, there's a lot of people in her family, and they're her sisters and brothers and stuff, and they'll drink it. I said, okay. So I went over there. I gave them the beer that I did not buy nor select, my cousin, in turn, gave me a pomatitsa, and I thought, <laughs> and I called my daughter, and I said, well, you didn't get your beer. You paid for it. Joanne got beer for her family, but I got the nut bread. I got the best deal, <laughs> and I, all I had to do was drive over there and deliver it. But family's important to us, as you can tell. So this is cabbage rolls. Everybody also, you know, has cabbage rolls. If you're Polish, you have what? Is it Glomka? Glomki? And for Croatian, it's Salama. And there's a little difference in each one. This is not cooked yet. I was taking a picture for a friend of mine who does not make it and wanted to learn, but I was making this specifically for her and her to take to her house. So I showed her and I said, okay, this is your batch. I'm going to finish cooking it. Well, now this picture, you know how they say that plating is the most important part of your food? Well, that is not well plated. It's actually brown sauce. Croatian people, when they make sarma, make a roux. And you use like 
in our family, say a half a cup of butter and a half a cup of flour, but you make it brown, but you don't make it so brown that it's bitter, but you don't want it white where it doesn't have the flavor. So you have to just keep on stirring it, and then you have hot water that you start adding to it so that it can get thinner. And so that sarma that is cooked on the wrong plate should have been a white plate, and instead it's a blue plate. But those are my plates, and that's all I'm doing. <laughs> so that's what I've got. And then, you know, that's just one cut open. But those are healthy foods that we did eat, and it also, because it does have rice in it and, you know, beef and pork, what happens is the food stretched. So when you had big families, the food went further. And it wasn't unusual, too, to have sarma at a wedding, you know? I mean, it's, but you had a lot of meat choices. People like, my brother's friends loved coming to our house. They would come, my dad would have fresh tomatoes that he'd slice from his garden. Then he usually had a roll of salami, you know, not from the package, but he got the whole thing. And he'd slice it up for the boys to eat and make sandwiches. My mom always had good pastries or strudel. And so they liked coming to our house because we ate a lot. <laughs> this is dumpling soup. My mom and oh, back to the roux. Let's go back to the roux a second. We also make stuffed peppers. You know, other nationalities make stuffed peppers too. Everybody does it a little different. That same roux is used for stuffed peppers. You know, again, you take the butter and the flour and you mix it up, but it tastes totally different because it has all the pepper seed flavors in it from simmering. And so, it, and we also made green bean and potato soup with that roux. And in the summer, you know, my mom would can all those green beans that my dad grew. And uh, it's like I was telling this gentleman, we did organic farming before it was in style, but they couldn't afford to buy the pesticides. My dad, after church on Sunday, would go to the stockyards in Kansas City, Kansas, and fill a box up with manure put it in the trunk of the car, and then he'd go spread it all over the garden. And so, our plants did grow. <laughs> but anyway, the roux was also used for green bean and potato soup. Again, a different flavor, different veggie. Dumpling soup, my dumplings, those are my dumplings. I make mine real big because I think that's the best part of the soup. But my mother made hers a third of, a half third of that size. So they would go further. And when I'm in Croatia and I stay with the family, you know, we make homemade noodles a lot too. I don't have a picture of those. But what they do, because remember, their economy is still totally different than ours. And I had been there prior to the war, and I came there right after the war. In fact, when I came there the second time, on our way to church, they were having First Communion, and I was walking with this gentleman that was staying at the house too, and some other people, and there's three helicopters going over the church. And I'm like, what's going on here? And he goes, well, you know, there's still a military, we had just gotten there, there's still a military presence here. And if they're gonna attack, it's gonna be today. And all I could think of was, well, at least I'd be in church. <laughs> uh, but NATO was there, and those were NATO helicopters. And when we walked into the church, as you went in, uh, the Italian NATO military was there, and you could tell that the children were accustomed to it because after they had received their first communion, the military guys went up to the kids, and the kids knew their names, and they knew their names, and they congratulated them. But a lot of the homes that had been there the first time now had bomb holes in them. Now, the last time I came, went back about five years ago, uh, it was being rebuilt. There were still some houses that had not been replaced or repaired, but it was being built back up. And now a lot of people, companies had come in and built some apartment buildings. I still stayed though with family people um, and their soup, because they fix you all the local dishes that I grew up on. Uh, they, when they make their homemade noodle soup, where I'm used to, and I don't know about you, when you buy Campbell's soup, you buy the extra noodle one. Well, no, you had maybe a couple of noodles and maybe one or two pieces of chicken. Yeah, it wasn't like we have today still. It's still not like that. 
cookies. We're getting to pastries. Okay, I just gave you a list of some pastries. Everybody has their thing. They have their own type of apple pie. Uh, cookies are big. If you ever get one of these peach cookies from somebody, they must like you a lot. They say, a uh, little peach cake. It's a cookie that's shaped like a pe peach. And it, it's, you know, you put the two to sides together like you do a macaroon. And what you do though, is when you make it, they carve out a little bit on each side because they put a nut filling in it that has, it can be peach or apricot jam, only because those don't melt out like other jellies and jams do. Walnuts and milk, and then it has, you know, the dark rum. And then you color it with some brandy and some pink and orange sugar. So they're very time consuming. So if anybody gives you one of those cookies, they like you because you just don't give those to anybody. Okay, figs are really big over there. Uh, my grandpa used to buy the figs on the ring and just eat them as a snack. There's a lot of cookies and a lot of things that you cook with figs. Um, they also have these black pepper cookies that are made with black pepper and they're not overly spicy or anything, but they're stamped cookies. They usually have them rectangularly. I don't do mine in rectangles. I just buy the stamp thing uh, that you buy and stamp them, the round circle ones. But I was thinking of that the other day because I'm getting ready to make Christmas cookies. I actually made some already, but I already ate them. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm waiting to finish the rest of them. And I thought, okay, the stamp cookies, I'm gonna try doing it round, but instead of using the cookie cutter to make sure that they're perfectly round and then putting the stamp in them, I am going to just slice them. Because they usually make them rectangularly, but I can never find a rectangle stamp. And when I'm over there, I've never looked for them, quite frankly, because I'm more interested in seeing things and eating their food than looking for something to make it with. Poon say, that's another thing that you see a lot of. It's uh, deep fried. Uh, they serve them at bridal showers, at weddings, and actually people make them and they put them in a bushel basket. That's how many they make. And they, it has a little bit of brown, uh, brandy in it, or you could put rum, any other liquor that you want. But it's not that much because as kids we ate them all the time. But they're crispy and they can make be like rosettes or some people roll it out and tuck the dough in and make it like a little knot. So there's a lot of different recipes. You can even make, I know Tony showed you these little hearts, but if you notice this heart has a mirror in them. Not all of them have a little mirror. When you do put a mirror in them, those are usually, those are Christmas decorations or decorative. And the mirror is supposed to be, originally it was men who were the big providers of these. And what they did was they would give it to the person they loved so that every time you looked at it, you would see the face, which would be yours, because they loved you, of the person that they loved, and it reminded you of them. There's also, you can make these hearts, though, and decorate them if you're really good at decorating. Uh, and they use, they use a honey dough, a honey sweet dough, or you can use gingerbread dough. I personally, when I make heart-shaped cookies, I use shortbread dough because that's what I like. That is not traditional though. If you're gonna make them though, make sure people know which ones are for decoration and which ones are <laughs> edible because the dough is different. Uh, this, the only reason I wanted to tell you about this, this is recognized, this little umbrella with the two little people uh, as a Croatian national souvenir. It is approved by the Croatian Chamber of Commerce. It was the first thing that was. These umbrellas that you see here, this is the top of an umbrella. It represents, there's a story about this that goes back a long, 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 long time ago, uh, that two people were in love and they had an umbrella. It was raining, it was bl a black umbrella. And his name was, well, her name was Jonica. His name was Johnny. And that's how the story goes. No proof anyway for this, no, <laughs> nothing. There's no scientific research on this. And, but when they kissed, it was so passionate, the umbrella turned red. And the stripes on it go along with their national costume. They're, 
they wore this national costume until, gosh, mid 1900s or so. I mean, that as their national costume, and so this represents that their country, and it's actually from a little neighborhood called Sistine. It's in it's, it's in Zalgrab, but it's one of the oldest neighborhoods there. And last I knew, the last time. I don't know if this guy is still alive, but the umbrellas that they sell used to be all handmade. Now some of them are machine made. There was only one man left that made them by hand. And he actually made the umbrellas by hand. So there's a lot of history there. Dolls, my daughter must have tons of those dolls. Of course, they're all still at my house. She's going to take them with her. But those are all things that are part of our ethnicity. Our families were not rich. Tony's wasn't. I went to grade school and high school with Tony, and then I worked with him later on at the med center. Our families were not rich, but they gave us good values, hard work, and like all of us worked at my aunt's restaurant. You know, it was just that's what you did. I mean, I can peel potatoes for 800 people. And that's not. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I can make potato salad for 800 people. But they told us, though, that education was, an, was very important, that my dad didn't want us to have to work like he did. And my mom, she had to go work when she was in the eighth grade because of the Depression. And there were eight kids in their family, and plus her mom and dad. So her and her mom went to the garment industry, and my mother sewed. And she went back and got her GED when my brother graduated from law school. All of us have a doctorate degree, and we paid for it ourselves. There was no money to pay for it. and But my mother never told us when you had to stop going to school. <laughs> she just said, but the thing was, you had to stay employed, you know, and so you kept on thinking, if I keep on going to school, I'll always have a job. And that's what they taught us. And that family's important and you help each other and, you know, and we do. <laughs> and so, in fact, I was telling her that Tony's dad, my little girl, uh, well, she's not little anymore, <laughs> but when she was little, his dad took a picture of her at Blessing of the Food with her basket, her Easter basket. It has been on my fireplace mantle ever since. And so when I ran into him at the museum, I said, I've got a picture that your dad took of my daughter. But, you know, it's, it was a community. You know, they say it takes a village. Well, it did. My kids went to the same school I went to, that my mom and dad went to. I had a teacher that my mom and dad had. My kids had a teacher that I had. And let me tell you, you couldn't get away with anything because they would tell on you. <laughs> and so you behave. And I think that's it. But I enjoyed coming here, and this has been fun. Thank you, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank both Tony and Judy um, for coming today, making the trip down from Kansas City and bringing us all this wonderful information. I learned a lot of new things, even though I am Croatian. Um, so we just have a couple of things. Um, Tony, would you pick a number between uh, 1 and uh, 45? 32. Darcy... McDonald. Is that who just walked out? Is that someone you could take this to? Yeah. Someone could? Okay. So she's going to get one of these bags. Janie, will you pick a number between 1 and 45? Uh, 45. 45. Tom. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You have won one of the gifts. Um, it is um, some kind of marmalade. It's either fig or tangerine. I'm not sure each one are different. So, and it's from Croatia. They were they were imported from Croatia. We got those. So. Um,
Okay, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, I'd like to remind you, and some of you that were here last time, there is a book for sale in our gift shop, and it is from Strawberry Hill. It's beautiful. It's about the Christmas uh, decorations and everything, and all the proceeds go to Strawberry Hill because they've been so kind to uh, bring all of their artifacts and everything. So there's a sample over on the table, and we have them for sale in the gift shop there, 19.95. So it's, it's a beautiful, full-color book. It's, it's really beautiful. I want to thank JT and Linda again. They always do such a wonderful job with our sound system. We couldn't do this without their help on that. Uh, we invite all of you to become a member. If you're not a member, it's $25 a year individual, $50 for a family. You get announcements on everything coming up, and you get a dinner for our membership dinner and a lot of perks that go with being a member. Our next exhibit, our quarterly exhibit, will open January the 2nd, and the title of it is I Do. Uh, and it is going to be about weddings, past and present. And uh, Jenna Mitchelson, is she was a Schroeder, uh, was her maiden name. She is, has some great programs and oh, games and music and surprises. A lot of history of the old weddings. There'll be a lot of photos, local photos that you'll love. It's going to be a great, it sounds pretty simple, I do, but it's going to be a great quarterly exhibit. And she'll have three programs uh, to go along with that. Uh, at the back desk on your way out is a stack of recipes. They're Croatian recipes. Uh, one is the traditional apple strudel, and then my American version of apple strudel. And there is a sample of the American version because, like your mother, I, do, I can remember my mother, the table that big, and she would stretch that dough. Seemed like it took forever, so I don't do that. <laughs> so I use puff pastry and roll it out as thin as I can. So, but the filling is the traditional what we use for apple strudel. So there's samples of that along with cookies and drinks and some other things. So we invite you to grab a bite on your way out and get a little a little taste of what. It's not the true apple strudel, but it's still pretty good. So um, you're welcome to stay and look at the exhibit. And we thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. And then my last plug is we are still fundraising <laughs> for. Uh, we've been donated a seven foot uh, screen to show all of our projections on rather than the TV over here. And the screen has been donated, but we have to buy the projector. So we're still fundraising for that. We're still about $2,000 short. So if you, there's a jar at the desk. If you drop in a dollar or even some change, it'll add up quickly. So we thank you for that. But anyway, thank you all for coming. Grab a snack and a drink. And you're welcome to look around, stay as long as you like and look at everything here. So thanks for coming.